Well, when we uh, open up the New Testament, you read a little bit about Jesus, you see uh, four groups of people primarily. You've got Jesus, compelling and always remarkable. Uh, you've got the disciples, fumbling along a little bit, but eventually getting it. You've got these large crowds of people, four or 5,000 people at times, looking in on Jesus. And then you've got the antagonists, the, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the religious leaders who are always objecting to Jesus. Uh, four groups, again, we could, we could debate that or organize it a little bit more. But as I mentioned those, as I mentioned those four groups, where do you see yourself? Where do you see yourself in that sort of who do you identify? Where do you sort of just fit in there? Just think about that for a moment. Uh, my name's Jeff Bennett. I have the privilege of being the lead pastor here at Harbor. And to our online community, welcome this morning. So glad you're watching now or at a later time. And let me say this, Great Lakes, you are awesome. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. Just wonderful. So thank you so much. Uh, you've blessed us today. And Great Lakes, our heart for you is the Christ you sang about. We pray you would just know him all the more deeply and all the more personally. So thank you for leading us in worship today. Uh, where do you fit in in the story? You know, again, which of those four? Jesus, the disciples, the crowd, the, the Pharisees. And I think we can look in and Jesus is compelling. And certainly, you know, we want to learn from him and be like him. The disciples, we can certainly identify with them and their fumbling and their bumblings. The crowds... You know, being compelled and wanting to come to Jesus. I think of the four, the ones we often don't see ourselves like, and maybe you did identify yourself, we often don't see ourselves as the religious leaders, as the Pharisees, as those people. We tend to see ourselves in all other parts of the story, and that's certainly accurate and true. I'm not diminishing that. But this morning, we also, I just want you to consider the thought that you also could be the Pharisee in the story. You could be the religious leader in the story. Let me tell you a little bit about the Pharisees. They were the insiders, right? And the longer that you have lived in church or been part of a church culture, you could consider yourself a religious insider. They knew the Bible well, certainly no debate on that. They lived by all standards, outward standards, moral and righteous lives. They kept all the rules. And if you think of the religious leaders in those tenses, in those terms, you see that we do have some similarities. But yet here's the thing with the Pharisees of Jesus's day. They just totally missed Jesus. They just totally missed him. They opposed him. They crucified him in the end, they missed him. These insiders who knew the religious world, who knew their Bibles, who lived by all appearances, outward moral lives, totally missed Jesus. And so here's my heart today. As we come and look in on these stories today, that to the degree that you fit in that category, an insider, knowing your Bible, living outwardly, morally, that we would not miss Jesus that we would realize that we have the potential to miss him just as they did, and that we would say, God, help me to see Jesus for who he truly is. And some of the things they miss were the best parts about Jesus, and they just didn't see it. So that's where we come today. We're in Luke chapter 5, verse 27, and we come to this new series called Jesus, Controversy and Compassion. We're walking through the book of Luke. Jesus has or Luke has introduced us to Jesus. Here he is. He is here. We've seen the credentials of Jesus, the beginning of his ministry. Now we sort of come to this section. It's hard to bring it all together. It was hard for me to outline, but the next four or five weeks where Jesus is faced with these criticisms, controversy, compassion. And then after that, then we see Luke, again, easier to outline, clear series as we continue to walk through uh, this. And so we come, and here's what's going to be interesting today. We're going to see four criticisms of Jesus. We, the fifth one was last week. If you remember, they said, who are you that can forgive sins? And we're going to see four more today. And where it starts is there's some opposition. And where we'll see it end is they are plotting to kill Jesus. 
And so they're going to challenge his authority, challenge who he is. And that's the journey we go on. And along the way, we'll see three things that they missed about Jesus. Three things. I'll do the first two briefly. And then the third one is where we'll spend most of our time. But I think we have the potential to miss all three. So Luke 5, verse 27. Let me read it for us. After this, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector by the name of Levi sitting at his tax booth. Follow me, Jesus said to him, and Levi got up, left everything, and followed him. Levi, also known as Matthew, who later becomes one of the 12 disciples, writes the book of Matthew. This is not his calling to be a disciple. This is just his general calling to follow Jesus. Leave everything and follow him, the same calling Jesus asks of every person. Levi was a tax collector, and when he meets Jesus, he does what we all want to do. He wants to make sure his friends meet Jesus. And so look down to the next verse. Then Levi held a great banquet for Jesus at his house, and a large crowd of tax collectors and others were eating with them. These are his friends. These are who his friends were, other tax collectors, other sinners. Then in verse, uh, the next verse, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who belonged to their sect complained to the disciples, not to Jesus, but to the disciples, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Here's the first criticism, right? Why are you spending time with these people, these sinners, these tax collectors? And so you, the, this first criticism is his openness, Jesus' openness in eating with those sinners, those who are far from God. Look down how Jesus answered. Jesus answered them. It's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Who did Jesus come for? He came for the sick. He didn't come for the righteous, but he came for sinners. And that's sort of what he's trying to communicate here in this moment. But just think about this. Jesus came for the most unlikely people. No one would have thought that these ones would would receive his blessing, his salvation. No one would have thought that some of these would become his disciples. You imagine telling the religious leaders, hey, this guy Matthew, who was just a tax collector a few hours ago and now is hosting a party with all of his sinner friends, he's going to become one of the 12 apostles. He's going to lead the church forward. They would have been over the top upset. Who is this man? You know, he's not qualified. Look at his past. He doesn't know anything. But yet what we're reminded of is Jesus and how he, who he is for and his openness towards them. Here's the principle. And we could talk about how Jesus is for sinners, but I want to just put it in slightly different terms. Those who received the gospel in Jesus' day were not like the others. Those who received the gospel were not like the religious leaders of the day. And here's the thing that I want to mark. The heart of Jesus, the thing we miss, is that the heart of Jesus is for people that are not like us. The heart of Jesus is that the gospel is for people not like us. And so the question we ask is how prepared are we to welcome and share the gospel with people that are not like us? Let me give you a couple of examples. Think about where you stand politically. Don't yell it out because we have all sorts of different options. Think about where you stand politically. Who you would vote for or who you would not vote for. If you had a U.S. election vote, who would you vote for in that election or not to? I know there's strong opinions. But here's my point. How prepared are you? To be and to share the gospel with someone who is the exact opposite political view of you do. Think of where you stand. Think of the person that's the exact opposite, the person that you in your mind stereotype and don't even like. How prepared are you to share the gospel with them? How much is your heart open towards them? How about with COVID? We all have strong opinions on COVID. Now think of the person that has exactly the opposite opinion of you do about COVID. Exactly the opposite. How prepared are you to share the gospel with them? To share the heart of Christ with them? And I could just go through a whole lot of issues. And I could just say, choose your issue and choose the person that's exact opposite of you. And how prepared are you to share the gospel with them? Now here's what I'm not saying. I'm not saying there's not important differences here. 
There's not good public policy and good debate we should have over these things. That's not my point. My point is, how much is our heart like Jesus' heart for people that are not like us? Different culturally, different language, different social status, different ethnicity. And what Jesus reminds us here is he is ready to preach the gospel to all, to love all. And as we, as you might think of yourself as an insider, here's what can happen. We can come become attached to our own particular type and style of Christianity. And we forget that Jesus is the one who wants to reach out to people who are outside of that. He is for those others, those not like us. If you want the really challenging test for this, And if you're online, you can think about where you're at. If you're at home right now, then you sort of even get a better example of this. But here's what Jesus is doing. He's eating with people. This is hospitality. This is hanging out. This is being with them. And so if you really want a challenging question would be, how often or when was the last time we spent time with people who are just the exact opposite of us, not like us, with the heart of bringing the gospel and the love of Christ to them? What we learn here is that we should not avoid difficult people. We should not avoid people that are not like us, but seek them out as Christ did to try to bring the gospel to them. So that's the first way. That's the first criticism and the first way that people missed Jesus. Look down to the next one, verse 32. They said to him, John's disciples often fast and pray, and so do the disciples of the Pharisees, but yours go on eating and drinking. So What they're noting here, what the criticism is, is when when people repented of their sin, there was these cultural things that people did. They, They mourned, they prayed these mournful prayers, they fasted, maybe put on sackcloth. You could see that they had repented and were turning a different way. John's disciples did it, the Pharisees did it, but Jesus's disciples are not doing it. If you're Jesus, you're like, I just can't win here. Look at the first criticism. The first criticism was you're eating with the wrong people. What's the second criticism? You're eating. You're like, I can't win. I can't win. The first question, the first criticism is about evangelism. You're hanging out with the wrong people. The second criticism is about discipleship, right? You're not developing your followers well. And here's what his followers were doing. They were eating and drinking. Here's what they were doing. They were having fun. They were hanging out. Here's the criticism. Jesus, your disciples are having too much fun They're too cheerful. Look at the answer he gives. Jesus answered, Can you make the friends of the bridegroom fast while he is with them? But the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them. In those days, they will fast. Jesus is saying, I'm the groom, we're at a wedding, and we're just going to enjoy the feast at the wedding reception. There'll be a time for fasting. But Jesus is saying, my presence brings great joy. It's like the joy of a wedding reception, immense joy, because he's met a desperate need. Go back to the first point. Anyone can come to Jesus. When we realize that and we come to him, it should fill us with great joy. And that's what Jesus is saying. There's great joy in knowing me. It's the joy of Jesus in having our sins forgiven. And that's sometimes just what we miss. We miss the great joy that Christ has forgiven us. I read a story this week and uh, about a man, and he talked about how when his family, and maybe some of you can think of your last Sunday, and hopefully, or sometime last weekend, you gathered for a big Easter dinner, lots of food, the table is full, all sorts of different desserts. And he said, when those moments came as a kid, he just loved those moments. He'd be like, I'm ready to pig out. I'm going to have one of every dessert. I'm going to eat tons of food. And he could just remember the joy in his, as in his heart as he came to those moments to eat. And then he said this, he said, there was always someone in my family that would pray this prayer. He said, oh Lord, make us mindful of those in the world who are starving right now. And he said, you know, there was always someone in my family who just wanted to rain on the parade, who wanted to ruin the joy of the moment. Now, I'm not saying this morning we should not care about those who have less than us. That really matters. That's not my point. Jesus' point here is this. Sometimes it's just good to be full of joy. 
being with Jesus is a time of immense joy. And we can just miss that. Here's the interesting thing. Too much joy can actually offend some people. That's what we learn in the story. His disciples were too happy. They were too full of joy. And Jesus is saying, I'm doing a whole new thing. Whole new thing. Not the old wineskins. The new wineskins have come, and it is a time of joy. Let us celebrate together. Here's what one author says. Joy is the infallible sign of the presence of God. Joy is the infallible sign of the presence of God. How do you know if you've really come to know Jesus? Is your heart full of joy? Maybe, and we miss this, don't we? We forget that there's real joy in following Jesus. And maybe you're here today or you're watching online and your whole experience with Jesus has just been rules or laws or externals, follow this and do this. And if you've missed that, can I just encourage you to look again. Do you see the good news here in the first two? One is that God is for sinners. He's for the unhealthy, not those who think they're good and righteous, but knows they have a need. And then the second point here is that God comes to forgive that sin. That's the good news of Christianity. And if you've wandered away from Christ, oh, wouldn't you return to him, knowing that he loves you and wants to know you? So that's the second criticism Jesus faced. The first is they missed out on, uh, on his heart for people. The second is they miss out on the great joy he brings. Here comes the third one. It's two different criticisms, but it's the same overarching one. Look down to chapter 6. One Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields, and his disciples began to pick some heads of grain, rub them in their hands, and eat the kernels. Some of the Pharisees asked, why are you doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? So here's what's happening here. We know the Ten Commandments. The fourth commandment is uh, do not work. Honor God by taking a day of rest. Set aside time from your regular work, and it's just a way that we glorify God. And so the disciples now... Uh, are doing something. What they're doing is they're reaping, threshing, winnowing, and preparing when they are plucking this grain. And what the Pharisees had done is they created all of these rules to try to know whether you'd actually worked on the Sabbath. You know, do no work on the Sabbath. Well, what does that actually mean? Well, in our day and age, here's what it could come down to. Again, no light switches back then. But is it work to turn on, on and off a light switch? Is that work or not? Does that violate the fourth commandment? And they had developed all of these rules. And so what these disciples did with reaping, threshing, winnowing, and preparing was a quadruple violation. They were at fault four times. Now, this was not God's law. This was their law. They had added all of these extra biblical requirements. Now, look what Jesus says. Next verse. Then Jesus said to them, the son of man is Lord over the Sabbath. Fascinating what Jesus does here. He doesn't say, I'll oh, forget the Sabbath. You know, it doesn't matter. He says, no, the Sabbath is important, but there's something greater than the Sabbath. There's something above it, something more supreme. And he's saying, I am supreme over the Sabbath. As great as the Sabbath is, I am even greater. Now keep that in mind. We'll go to see the, the fourth criticism, similar, both dealing with the Sabbath. Go down to verse 6. On another Sabbath, Jesus is in the synagogue. He's teaching. We've learned that's what he did every Sabbath. He went to the synagogue and taught. There's a man in there who's got his right hand is shriveled. And then Jesus, he's making this point now. Then he asks the question of the religious leaders. I ask you, which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save life or destroy it? What a great question. What's better to do today, good or evil, save or destroy life? Well, they didn't answer. But then, verse 10, he looked at them all, and then he said to the man, stretch out your hand. He did so, and his hand was completely restored. So what's the fourth criticism Jesus gets? He heals on the Sabbath. Was this lawful? Yes, it was lawful, because it was healing. It was good. That's the point Jesus is making. Now, he's not saying this. He's not saying, I'm Lord of the Sabbath, so I can do whatever I want. He's saying, I'm the Lord of the Sabbath, and you guys have missed the purpose of this day. 
This day is about mercy and love. You've missed the heart of the Sabbath. And look what happens next. This is where we'll pause for a moment. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law were furious and began to discuss with one another what they might do to Jesus. This set them off. Now they're ready to kill him. It's interesting. Jesus is so good here. He's so good. He doesn't do any work by their laws to heal this man. Do you notice what he did? He just said, reach out your hand. The only thing he did was just some words out of his mouth. And all the man did was reach out his hand. And he's totally healed. Jesus did nothing by their standards. But they're upset because the man is healed because of Jesus' words. But then look at their words. They're plotting the murder of someone on the Sabbath. And that seems to be okay by their standards, but not healing. Now, interestingly enough, we pause here. And I just want to pause and just talk about this Sabbath idea, how we can miss this. Here's what we miss. The rest of Jesus from our work. The rest of Jesus from our work. Now, here's we can look in and say this. We can look in and say, oh, yeah, those Pharisees, they had all these rules. You know, they're all legalists. We don't need to do that anymore. We don't need to follow them. We're free, you know, in this day and age. That's not quite what Jesus is saying. What Jesus is saying is this. I'm all about the Sabbath. The Sabbath is what I'm about. And you guys, you've missed it. You've missed the Sabbath. Here's the gift of the Sabbath. It looks too good to be true. God says to us, stop working and rest for one day out of seven. How utterly kind of him, isn't that? Think he creates creation, gives us this whole paradigm, and he says, here's something too good to be true. I just want you to stop working and rest. Look at the kindness and the heart of God for us. He intends to free us from the burdens that we face. He says, I've created a day for you, not to be a burden to you, but to be a joy and a gift to you. And so think about it in these terms for a moment. Let me ask this question. This morning, would you say your soul is flourishing, that it's thriving in your spiritual journey? Or might you say you're drained spiritually? Just empty feeling, you know, or somewhere along on that spectrum. Well, if you would be more on the drain side, you know, you can say, well, here's my, you know, I'm free from the rules and they're not a burden to me and I can do whatever I want. But I think what Jesus would say is you've missed the heart of the Sabbath. You've missed the heart that I have designed a day to give you rest. And let me say this, this is particularly important for North American culture. Do you know why? Because we're one of the most workaholic cultures ever in human history. We need to hear this point. We need to be aware of it. And Jesus says, I want to give to you one of the things that is most crucial to you in your spiritual journey. And so here's how I just want to finish my time. By trying to say, as we look at this great gift he gives us of rest, that we so often miss, how do we actually find the rest that he offers? How do we not miss it in our day and age? And I've got three ideas for you on how we find the rest that he offers in the midst of this. Here's the first one. You'll see the slide for it. Preach rest to yourself. Now, I'm using rest here synonymous with the gospel. Right? Preach the gospel of rest to yourself every day. Here's what I mean by that. Our salvation is secure. We are free to rest in the finished work of Christ. So think of it with me for a moment. Think of all the work you do, but then beneath that there's a work. There's something that motivates us, that's something that keeps us going. And it's oftentimes this, I want to be significant. I want to be successful. I need security. I need acceptance. I have to perform. There's that work beneath the work that we're always, that's sort of always ramping us up, always keeping us going. And that affects every relationship and can affect our relationship with God. God, I've just got to work for you. I've got to perform for you. I've got to be accepted by you. And here's the good news of the gospel of rest. It's not your works, but it's the finished work of Christ. You don't need to work for God's acceptance. God accepts you not because of your record, but because of Christ's record. 
God accepts you not because of your work, but because of Christ's work on the cross. It's the one relationship where we don't always have to be striving, always have to be doing, always wondering, have I done enough? Have I, have I made enough? Have I made enough progress? Does God love me? He says, no, your salvation is secure. Just rest in Christ. So when we realize that that most important relationship, that we can rest in Christ for his finished work for us, it just calms us. It helps us rest. Not to be all ramped up thing, and I gotta be significant, I gotta get security, and I have to perform, and I have to do this. It just helps us there. And so that's why every day we need to preach the gospel of rest to ourselves. If you want rest from all the things that move you in this world, come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. And maybe this morning for some of you, you're ramped up trying to find significance and security, trying to earn your favor with people or with God. Can I just invite you? Christ has done it all for you on the cross. Just let his record become your record. Let his acceptance become your acceptance. Come to Christ and trust in him. And if you would say this morning, I've come to Christ, but you still don't feel the rest, then you really don't know what you have. Keep preaching the gospel of rest. Keep going deeper so you understand it. So the first way we find rest is simply preaching the gospel of rest to ourselves every day. Here's the second way. We celebrate rest at the start of every week. Wasn't this morning good? I, my soul's full. I've enjoyed worshiping our God together. I need that every week. We gather to worship. We gather to fill ourselves up for what Christ has done for us. We need that, every single one of us. And if we want to enjoy the rest that Christ has given us, we should order our calendar in such a way where we are together every week. It's a great reminder for ourselves that we need Christ. It's a great way to teach our children and grandchildren and nieces and nephews and what matters. And it's a great way to demonstrate to the world, here is what matters. Here's what's important to me. More important than school and sports and recreation and work and all the other things. So if you want to find the rest that Jesus offers you, preach rest to yourself every day. Celebrate rest at the start of every week. And then here's the third thing. Prioritize rest over the course of every week. Again, I don't want to spend my time this morning on do's and don'ts for the Sabbath or for a Sunday. You know, some work is necessary. I'm thankful today that the hospitals are open. Thankful that if you call 911, the police and fire department will come to your house or wherever else you need them. Some work has to go on. We, we know that. And God's okay with that. It's merciful. It's protecting. It's healing work, just like we read in the story. But yet here's the principle. Set us apart one day each week to be rejuvenated in God. If it can't be the first day of the week, Sunday, then find another day. Set aside one day to be rejuvenated to be filled back up again. And I know, here's the thing, we can argue all about the Sabbath, there's tons of debates, there's tons of things we can say, you'll mention them to me afterwards, but here's my thing, let's not debate about Sabbath rest, let's just do it, let's just do it, let's just start there, let's just take that time. And here's what you did, here's, if you were to do that, just set aside one day from your studies, from your work, from whatever, one day, here's what you get. You know, 52 a year, you get an additional seven weeks of vacation. I know vacation's not the right word, but you get an additional seven weeks. Sometimes we think, yeah, I'm gonna do this on vacation. Here's what God said in his kindness. I'd like you to do it every seven days. Take one day and rest and stop working. So here's, as you think about this third point, would you accept the gift of one day's rest a week from God? Would you just accept that gift? Would you humble yourself to believe that you need it? You do. And here's how that helps. We have to admit that our wealth and our significance and our advancement don't really depend on us that much anyway. It depends on God far much more. So when you accept the gift, you have to realize that. What does it look like? Here's Mark Buchanan. Here's what he says. How do you prioritize rest over the course of a week? Cease from what is necessary. Embrace that which gives life. Cease from what is necessary. Embrace that which gives life. 
the day is to be something that fills us. I, I would think so many of you have uh, times on your calendar that are non-negotiable in a week or over a month time. You know, just as a simple example around Harbor, we have staff meeting here at 11 o'clock on Tuesdays. And so if you were to call me or email me and say, hey, Jeff, could we get together Tuesday at 11? My answer would be no. No, not that I don't want to get together with you, but I've already put something in that time slot. There's no other claims on that time. It's booked in there. Now, of course, an emergency comes, we flex, but generally, all the staff at Harbor are around the table on Tuesday at 11 o'clock. We've just all put a stake on our calendar because that matters. And many of you do the same things. You've got different claims and different stakes on your calendar where I do these things and nothing coming in is interrupting them. I think when we look in on this principle, here's what Jesus is saying. Make the first claim on your calendar. Put the first stake for a day of rest. Just block that off and cease from all that is necessary. Make that be the first claim. And so you can say, Wednesday morning work, you don't have any claim on my day of rest. You know, Friday afternoon crisis, you have no claim on my re day of rest. Other tasks that aren't done, and they always wanna to try to claim that, don't they? No claim, I've staked it out, I've blocked it off. And then what do we do? Embrace that which gives life. Worship God, come to church, read your Bible, read a good book, think about Christ, enjoy people, enjoy family, linger longer at the dinner table and laugh, show mercy, take a nap, go for a walk, all of these things. Take a day and enjoy it. That's what he's called us to do. And so here, this is, I think, so important for us, Harbor. In the midst of all of us living exhausted lives in this crazy world, God has got something for us. He's got the gift of the Sabbath. Don't miss it. If you're exhausted and grumpy and grouchy all the time, then especially, it's so simple. Just take the gift of the Sabbath. Humble yourself to receive it. It's a simple thing. It's a bold move. But God has that for us. Don't miss it. Don't miss it like they did. What are the three things we miss? We miss the heart of God for all people. We miss the joy of what it means to follow Jesus. And we miss the gift of the rest he gives us. That's what the Pharisees missed. Now, if you look down just in the next section, what happens next? Jesus appoints the 12 disciples. It's a very timely appointment. You know, after five criticisms, and now they're plotting his death. Hey, who wants to follow me? And the 12 say, you know, Jesus appoints them, and they follow him. Here's the good news, that in the midst of all of this, some actually got Jesus, and they follow him and they decide to live after him. And may God give us grace this morning to not be like the Pharisees who miss Jesus, but be like the disciples and say, Jesus, we will follow after you in your heart, your joy, and the rest that you offer. Let me pray for us this morning. God, we thank you, Lord, for this great gift of rest. You are so kind. You are so gracious. And God, we miss it. We miss it. And so, God, I pray, Lord, particularly on this third point, God, that you would help us as a church to humble ourselves, to receive the rest that you offer us. First, the rest in Christ, and then the rest from the work and all the craziness of a week. And God, may we live in this way counterculturally. May we live this way as an act of worship and dependence and faith towards you. And we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. We end each service with four words at Harbor, so I'll just invite you to stand as I uh, dismiss us today. But let me, before we go, let me read these words from Hebrews, and it relates to rest. Here's what the author of Hebrews says. There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from their works, just as God did from his. Let us, therefore, make every effort to enter that rest. Let's make every effort to enter the rest. Harbor, we are sent.